thanks again for having me uh, and for having me speak about my favorite topic, uh, which is legal issues in digital humanities or legal issues in humanities research and education. Um, at the very base of the whole thing, of, of the problem really is, uh, at least in many universities, that there are legal departments, of course, there are also research data management departments, but there are very few actual guidelines or, um, or assistance schemes for individual uh, lecturers, for individual researchers uh, to deal with legal aspects of our work, like copyright and also like uh, data protection. And data protection, of course, is something that I want to talk about today and about the Daria EU Elder Consent Form Wizard. Um, you can see uh, various uh, logos on this slide. Um, one of them, the Digital Culture Project, which I'm very proud to be part of and which uh, will also feature some information on uh, the GDPR, obviously, and about the, uh, the tool that I'm going to show you in the next couple of minutes. So it's also featured in that uh, Digiculture uh, MOOC, and you're very welcome to try it out there. Um, it will be ready, I guess, uh, at the beginning of next week. So consider it a, a Christmas present kind of that you can play, away, uh, play around with. Uh, now, this wizard, as we call it, has been developed inside Daria EU. Uh, Daria EU is an infrastructure project, a research infrastructure uh, funded by the European Union. Uh, dealing with digital arts and humanities. Um, in this uh, digital research infrastructure, there are a couple of working groups dealing with various topics, and one of them is ELDA, uh, which is short for Ethics and Legality in Digital Arts and Humanities. And that's the working group where we try to, as, we, as it says here on the slide, where we try to address needs of the DH research and education community regarding legal issues, uh, also research ethics, which is also an important uh, topic, of course. Uh, and we try to put out, you know, workshops, training materials, um, guidelines for, on one hand, intellectual property rights and licensing, because that's a very hot topic, uh, also in the production of, for example, open educational resources, but also data protection and privacy which very much ties into research ethics because there are certain legal requirements that you have to take care of if you're working with people and with living persons and their data. But even if there was not a legal obligation to take care of these things, um, there is very much an ethical um, obligation to deal with these things in a mature and uh, transparent way. Uh, so we tried to produce all sorts of things. Uh, and one of the things that we came up with uh, was to create a wizard for consent forms, consent forms in a research and education um, context uh, that are compliant with the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation of the European Union, uh, which of course applies to um, all the member states of the European Union and the researchers and educators uh, dealing with these topics um, in this context. Uh, so to give you a little bit of background information, because I think that's very important to kind of, you know, get some of the terms right um, about the GDPR or General Data Protection Regulation. Uh, it's a regulation, not a directive. So it became like formal and official European law um, when it was introduced or when it was, uh, when it um, became valid on the 25th of May, 2018. So it's been around for a while, but even though it has been around for a while, it has been around kind of even longer because data protection is nothing new, even though one would think it is something new because of the outrage and, and, and publicity that the whole thing got. However, data protection has been around for a long time, uh, even a century at this point. <laughs> Uh, and also actually in the European Union uh, contract itself. Uh, so it has always been an issue and now it's been regulated. If you want more information about that, uh, you, you have the links here so you can look it up uh, if you are interested in the GDPR. Uh, it's not as arcane as it sounds. 
Uh, it applies to the processing of personal data by automated means and also by non-automated means, as long as they are, uh, as it's part of a fighting system, that's just on a side note, for example. So if we keep records, for example, if I kept a list of your names and IP address is in printed form and stuck it into a, um, into a folder, for example, uh, and put it into my office, that would also be subject to the GDPR, even though it's not digital. So the, the, the general data protection regulation doesn't just apply to the digital world, and that's very important. Uh, what it also doesn't apply to is dead people, because for very, yeah, it's, it's basically by the definition of the GDPR, um, personal data only applies to living people. Um, however, of course, personal data of dead people could apply to their living descendants and so on, but we're not going to get into that because that would be a lecture all of its own. Uh, what is processing? Processing is any operation or set of operation which is performed on personal data. That includes the collection, uh, the retrieval, the, the disclosure of it, the, dis the transmission of it, but also the deletion of it. So that's an important aspect of the whole thing. So whatever you do with personal data is encompassed under the term processing from the very collection and generation up to its deletion. Um, what is personal data? Personal data is any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. Uh, you have the definition of what is identifiable here. Um, I won't go into that in too much detail, but let's just say if a person can be identified without too much trouble and by legal means because of their picture, their voice, uh, any data that you have, like a personalized IP address, et cetera, et cetera, that makes the person identifiable. If, it's, if the person is already identified by you know, having a name tag or whatever, of course, it also applies. Uh, what is very important in this context, especially for, for research purposes, is if you use anonymized data, so data that is no longer traceable uh, to an identifiable person, uh, it is not subject by the GDPR. And that's a very important distinction. So anonymization is not subject to the GDPR. The GDPR defines seven principles of data processing that we have to take care of if we process personal data in any context. And the most important, and that's why it's listed on top of this, is lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. And that's where the consent form wizard comes in, because lawfulness can be achieved through various different means. Uh, and you have a, a, a more extensive list here if you want to look it up afterwards. But in our context, the most important part is the consent of the person concerned. So if you're processing personal data of a specific person and you have collected the consent of the person, you're allowed to process it and use it. Um, now, that also ties into the rights of the data subject. There are three different roles in the GDPR. There is the data controller who decides which data is collected and how the data is collected. Um, there is another role which, which we won't get into, get into. And there is uh, the data subject, which is you and me uh, in very, very many contexts. Whenever, For example, right now, <laughs> uh, as we are processing uh, your personal data for this lecture, for example, or for this entire webinar. Um, and as a data subject, you have a set of rules that is guaranteed by the European Union. Um, the right to information, access, rectification, and so on and so on. It's all there for you to look up afterwards, uh, but we are fairly short in time, so I'll stick to the most important part. And the most important part in this context is information. And this information has to be given at data collection. So that means for you, for example, as a researcher or as an educator who collects personal data from their pupils or from their research subjects, you have to inform them about the purposes of the data, the extent of the data you're collecting, um, the duration um, of uh, like how long are you keeping the data and so on and so on. 
And this information has to happen at that very point. And of course, there are certain formalities that you have to observe when you're gathering consent or informing your data subjects. And usually, researchers and educators aren't trained for these things because training for the, such uh, stuff is usually only happening at legal departments and very few of us are actually at legal departments. But we are still, of course, subject to these laws. And that's why a tool like the consent form wizard might prove useful to you. Um, what we have to keep in mind is, here is an, a, a more thorough listing of the right to information that you, that you have to give to your data subjects. Um, what we have to keep in mind is that there are also some exceptions to the GDPR um, for archiving purposes in the public interest, scientific or historical research purposes, or statistical purposes. That's in Article 89 and has been transferred into national laws since. And that means that certain rights that I have mentioned just before, like, for example, access to the data rectification and also deletion, for example, of the data can be uh, restricted for research or statistical or archival purposes. Um, if um, the execution of these rights would render your achievement impossible. So for example, if you conduct a research survey with people uh, and suddenly your data subjects after you have done all your interviews would like to withdraw their consent again, um, it's not that easy to do it because if you collected that for a research study and you couldn't complete your research study without processing the data and they knew about it being part of a research study at data collection, then they cannot actually withdraw their consent, or at least you are not obliged to follow uh, that, uh, but can actually keep the data if otherwise your research results would be impaired. So that's very important uh, to keep in mind. Um, again, all of this is additional context information for you. If you want to get a little bit deeper into this, this whole topic, look it up. It's a, it's a very brief, short uh, form here in the slides, uh, but there is a lot more information on the links that I posted, for example, uh, where you can look to. Uh, so the last five minutes, uh, I'll show you the consent form wizard, the tool that I want to present to you. Um, you can find it under this link. Uh, I can also post link in the chat or maybe someone else can do it uh, who is quicker at changing the the screen um yeah we're good. Can, perfect yeah so you can find it at consent daria eu uh and this consent form uh is geared towards three different scenarios which we identified through basically doing a survey and doing interviews with colleagues ourselves um, at conferences at working group meetings and so on and so on. And the three most common scenarios where people didn't wanted some help with it was processing data from and or about living people for research purposes, like an interview, like a survey, stuff like that. Uh, communication through mailing lists or other digital communication channels and processing data from participants as the host of an academic event. And that's the scenario that we are briefly going to look into just to give you an idea of what the whole thing looks like and what you can use it for afterwards. Uh, because uh, the webinar, for example, that we are all attending right now is an academic event. And if you want to get a consent from uh, participants for a similar event, for example, uh, or a workshop or whatever, uh, or also a conference, uh, the tool can help you with that and provide a template for you that you can then adjust to your specific purposes. Um, and since I'm a very brave person, I'm now going to switch over to a live presentation. We'll see if that's going to work. Um, so I hope you're still seeing my screen and you see the landing page of the Daria Elder Consent Form Wizard now. Um, Again, here is some information about what this tool is and what it is not. And I'll mention it here briefly as well. Now, this tool is based on the GDPR. So it does create GDPR compliant consent forms. It has been developed with legal experts. So all of it is sound, all of it is legal. However, it's still an online tool 
produced in an academic project. So, you know, sometimes if it's becoming very difficult or whatever, uh, you may have to consult a lawyer, of course, especially if it's about national peculiarities. However, for the scenarios that I mentioned, for about 90% of these scenarios, uh, the tool should be good and should uh, serve all your, your purposes and needs. There is a short introduction of who we are. And of course, we ask for your consent while you fill out the form, because otherwise we couldn't process your, the data you fill in. So we try to practice what we preach. Um, and if you go on enter, um, you see these three scenarios, and then you can choose which one you want to um, look into. And for our uh, short presentation, we're going to look at gather data and or consent from participants as the host of an academic event. Now, once you do that, and I've prepared the template before, um, you fill in certain information and basically the tool will only be as good as the information you provide. If you choose not to be honest when you fill out the tool, you shouldn't expect to get you know, a useful result. But the better the data is that you put in, the better will it suit your needs uh, when, you, when the template is created. So you have to fill in the institution, the address, the contact person, et cetera. And if there is a data protection officer, which for example, the University of Graz has, and I'm sure Timo Schroeder, for example, has one too, uh, you fill out the data for that person as well. Then uh, the whole thing becomes a very interactive form. So basically we ask you questions and as you answer these questions, additional questions will be generated based on the answers that you give. So for example, if you need the data for the organization and management of the event, the organization of related events, and for example, about, uh, you also want to um, promote and document the event, for example. Let's stick with these three scenarios for the time being. And the event is whatever, a school, just for, for, um, for purposes of, of going through the tool. Uh, now, the next question is, what information are you collecting from your participants and how long are you going to keep it? You will certainly collect the name and the surname. And then you can decide for yourself how long you want to keep it or how long you need to keep it. Uh, the form also helps you to get a grip of basically the, the necessities of, and the planning stages of these events as well, not just the legal, uh, the legal issues, but it kind of forces you to structure your, your event uh, and the data you need in order to address that structure. And if you want to be safe, for example, you can always say as long as necessary to achieve the purpose, which for this particular purpose that we defined here um, would, would be as long as you need for the management of the event, for example, and then you would have to delete it. Um, if you, for example, also collect the email address and you promise that you're going to uh, delete it after one year, uh, you can put that in as well and it will be uh, then later uh, given to your uh, consent form. Um, the most important question is, will you share the data? And that's an important question because sometimes you may think that you're not sharing the data, but if you give it, for example, to your press agency at your local university, then you are actually sharing the data because then you as the organizer are filling out this consent form, but then you're sharing it with other colleagues at your university. So we will say yes, but for simplicity's sake, we will say that we only share it with colleagues at our own research institution, because then we don't have to fill out anything extra. If, for example, I was also organizing the school and then sharing the data with Diana, um, we would say colleagues at another research institution. And then I'll keep it brief now. Uh, we would type in Timisoara and we would choose the country because obviously in which country you are uh, distributing the data is very important. And there are only uh, the European economic area countries and these countries that are listed here, um, which uh, provide adequate um, safety um, uh, measures for data to be transferred if you still want to stick with the GDPR. 
Um, so basically what would happen if we put uh, in, in a different country, then the wizard would actually tell us that it can't help us any longer because we are not allowed to transfer country to another, uh, to uh, transfer data to another country, which does not um, commit to the same safeguards. Um, we will continue here. Um, because I want to just show you what it what the whole thing looks like. You get a summary. If you find out that you have probably forgotten something, you can edit it again. Uh, that's a very, very, it doesn't really look nice, but it's actually just an intermediary stretch. And if you then go to finish, you will get this output, which is a full information on the data processing that you intend to do and a declaration of consent for your data subjects to sign. And you can take this text and then put it onto a web form. You can also print it, put it on an analog thing, add your own logos or institutional uh, contact data to it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we, what we set out to do. Uh, we want to give you a GDPR compliant information form, but also consent form that you can then adjust and adapt to your own purposes. Uh, and use in the context that you require it to use. Um, so I hope you will find the tool useful. Um, if you find any bugs or if you have any suggestions where things get too difficult, where you would re we require more information, um, we can still work on the project and we are very, very grateful for any feedback that we get about it. Uh, and uh, just as an uh, additional information for now, the data is only there in English. But we are currently working on translations in, into various uh, European languages. So far, we haven't found someone for Romanian yet. So if you're volunteering, please let me know. Um, and yeah, we hope to have this whole thing as a multilingual tool uh, before too long. And uh, hopefully it will be useful in your context as well. Thanks for your attention. Bye.